Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. We appreciate you uh, joining us tonight, and uh, thank you for letting us have a break last week. We all uh, enjoyed our little bit of time off, uh, just kind of catch up and, and take a breath for a little bit, but we're excited to uh, be back on tonight talking about microburst. Um, uh, most of the area in the Carolinas, even down into Georgia, Virginia, have all experienced uh, some microburst over the past month or so. Uh, so we thought it would be uh, really important to just kind of dedicate a show to that and just talk about the dangers of microburst and uh, what makes them different from tornadoes. So hopefully after uh, the show tonight, you'll have a, a better idea of exactly what a microburst does and the difference between that and a tornado. Uh, so we have uh, Brad Panovich on with us tonight. He is the chief meteorologist at uh, WCNC. NBC Charlotte, and we also have uh, Chris Michaels on with us, uh, weekend meteorologist at WCYB up in the uh, Tri-Cities area. He works with Ricky, and uh, Ricky is with us as well. He's trying to get um, our Facebook Live up and going. We're going to kind of uh, uh, stream it, uh, our show via Facebook Live and on our uh, YouTube page here, so uh, he'll be joining in us in just a little bit. And we also have Shay and James on with us tonight. Um, I do believe Kit is out of town, and Peter is also out of town, so uh, they won't be joining us tonight, so we miss those guys, but uh, we'll have those uh, have them back on shortly. So uh, before we do that, it's kind of been a wet uh, afternoon here in the Carolinas. I know uh, James has uh, got some footage of uh, some flooding that's taken place in the Statesville area, and Brad uh, Panovich uh, works uh, for the Statesville area. He has uh, coverage over that area, so... Brad, we've seen a lot of heavy rain in states, well, I think a little bit over seven and a half inches in, in a short amount of time. So um, these uh, slow-moving thunderstorms creating some headaches up in that area. Yeah, really unreal because it was such a small area that was impacted. And if you looked at the radar reflectivities, this didn't look like anything impressive. But um, this is one of those, if you've ever been in a tropical system, these very low-topped, very warm um, rain efficient uh, thunder showers. I wouldn't even call it thunder showers. There's not even a lightning bolt in this thing. But you know the the precipitable waters today in the Greenville uh, Green Greensboro sounding was like in the 90th percentile for this for this date. So we had about two inches of precipitable water, and these showers formed, and they just sat there. And 7.68 inches of rain fell in Statesville from 10:45 to about four o'clock in the afternoon, and as you can see from James' pictures there, it's unbelievable the amount of amount of water. Yeah, a lot of a lot of rain there, and I do believe a lot of streets were closed down. I uh, got some reports, maybe in 40, Interstate 40 was affected uh, a few times throughout the event. So wow. uh, our thoughts are with those uh, folks who uh, experienced the flooding in Statesville, hopefully uh, not a lot of damage done there so uh, you guys can dry out. But unfortunately... Looking at radar, uh, we have some more rain moving through the area uh, in Statesville and throughout uh, central and western North Carolina. It looks like it's going to be like that uh, throughout the night, maybe even into tomorrow. And for that, a flash flood watch has been up for uh, most part of western North Carolina and uh, uh, the Piedmont area also of North Carolina until 8 a.m. tomorrow. And uh, we'll have to see as, as the night goes on and into the morning that may be extended with uh, some more heavy rain. Uh, possibly uh, tomorrow. So, uh, Chris Michaels, you're up in the uh, Bristol, Tennessee area. Uh, how's the weather been on that side of the mountain? Have you guys seen the heavy rain up there? Has it kind of been a calm and, and tranquil day up there? Uh, for the most part, calm, but it's been the, uh, the spotty convection that we usually get during the summertime. Um, but it's been cool to see the August wedge in place, and that's probably one of the reasons why you have those low top showers going on. Not a, an incredible amount of convective potential, I'd imagine, east of the mountains, but uh, it's been cool to see the, the temperature difference. We got to 91, I believe, here in the Tri-Cities, but then you got places like Marion and West Jefferson that they were just stuck in the 60s and 70s. So, uh, cool to see that. Um, trying to think of what else. Other than that, just kind of hot and humid during the afternoon. We just got over our second hottest July on record. We hit 90 degrees, 20 out of 31 days, which is kind of uncommon for us. And we had a stretch of weather that was the hottest that we had seen in four years. So we're getting over that, and now it's kind of typical summertime stuff with the exception of the wedge of play right now. Definitely. And Brad, uh, you guys as well, I think this was yeah. the first day in how many days it didn't touch 90 in Charlotte? 17 days in a row up until today. It was Ju July 16th the last time we had a day below 90, and we had our third warmest July on record here. So 
Um, yeah, July was insane. I mean, but what's what's fascinating to me, the last summer is still hotter than this summer. <laughs> And for whatever reason, everybody keeps saying how hot this summer is. And the difference is we've had more hours of the heat index above 100 this summer already than we did all of last summer. So it's been a muggier, more humid summer, so it's felt a lot hotter, even though the actual air temperature numbers are running a little bit behind. We're both probably going to be in a top 10 hottest summer, like last year was the fifth hottest summer, fourth hottest summer. Right now we're running around 8, 9, 10. So we're actually behind last year, but it's still a top 10 hottest summer so it's you know we're quibbling over tenth of a degree it, it's hot regardless of how you slice it I agree with you the humidity just seems to be oppressive this year I don't yeah. remember the humidity being so so high you know I know last summer it was hotter but it didn't seem as humid so. yeah I know we had our first hundred and five degree heat index for an hour in Charlotte this year the first one since 2012 so it's been a while since we've had a, a heat index value of that high around here I mean Every day, it seems like if, if, if the, the dew point drops below 70, that's like a minor. Really. Yeah. Well, let's uh, toss it down to the coast. It's been hot down there, but at least you have a breeze, right, Shay? How's, uh, how's the weather been in the Charleston area? Yeah, we've had a little bit of a breeze uh, for several days now. It doesn't stop the heat from coming. I and mean, we in, Our inland values, uh, we've been averaging upper 90s to near 100. July was absolutely our hottest month ever in Charleston. Uh, also, our hottest month ever in Charleston, for that matter. So we topped out, I think, about 86.2 degrees total. Uh, that's with the high and the low combined together. Uh, so we had record-breaking July here on, on two different levels. As far as sea breezing goes, it has been helping out at the beaches a little bit, but our sea surface temperatures are up to 87.4 degrees. So you know your 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 high temperature will not get below that during the daytime whatsoever, even with the onshore breeze. So uh, if you're in the water, it doesn't feel too bad, but uh, not too much relief. But just like what Brad said, recently we've had this sort of an undulating front drop down to the southeast region and uh, making things really humid, lots of rain. Uh, as he said, these these showers and, and rains without even the thunderstorms, we've had a lot of cumuliform banking going on here in the Charleston area. Some water spouts were sighted this morning, and uh, we'll probably continue to see that pattern tomorrow. That's always kind of an exciting thing if you can get out to the beaches to see those early morning uh, fair weather clouds spin up a couple of uh, water spouts. It's kind of neat. But our, our precipitable water uh, started out about 2.2 to 2.4 this morning. And now it's right about 2.3 and it looks to stay fairly saturated through today and tomorrow and then maybe clear out with the Bermuda High reinforcement on Friday. So that's kind of where we are and uh, uh, at least we're getting a little bit of a break from the heat. And that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a good thing because it's going to come back after this is all gone. And I, I, I know we didn't discuss this before the show, but I know you're prepared for it. We did get a hurricane today. Talk to us a little bit about that. I know you've been uh, watching uh, the tropics for us. That's right. Yeah, we were watching a uh, storm cut across the Western Caribbean, and it picked up some momentum once it got south of Jamaica. And uh, as Levi Cowan stated in Tropical Tidbits, the tropical wave axis did fall uh, or actually go vertical and then lean over towards the negative direction. So it actually got a little bit of forward momentum to get that surface circulation wrapped around it. Uh, once that happened, it got into an area more favorable for development with the easterly trades relaxing on that side of 80 degrees west. So that's kind of the, um, the number you look for where the easterly trades slow down. And uh, that storm is starting to blow up now, so it became Hurricane Earl on the 4 o'clock p.m. update from the NHC this afternoon. It's uh, preparing to make landfall tonight in Belize, so keep them in your thoughts. They are uh, at a very low uh, sea surface level, uh, basically for Belize City. And they, they, the whole city lies very low, uh, so they're not really protected by any high ground. Uh, so I'm expecting the surge to be especially damaging to that area. Well, I hope that they will fare well, but the winds are 75 miles an hour from the last uh, update that I saw, in, unless things have changed on the 8 p.m. update. I think you got it on screen there. Yeah, I'm going to check for you, Shay. Sure. I think 75. So 75. Yeah, the, uh, Hurricane Excellent. Recon went in this today, and, uh, and and they found that the pressure was pretty much staying right around 997, 989, and uh, we'll expect it to pretty much stay the same. It could gain a little bit of strength once it edges out into the Bay of Campeche, but it'll probably be a weakened uh, tropical storm at best by the time it gets there. Once it hits those mountainous areas, it's probably going to have some uh, shear and some uh, some of the storm basically ripped apart as it goes across the Yucatan Peninsula. So that's uh, keep them in your thoughts tonight. 
Yeah, most definitely. So we'll we'll keep an eye on that. And uh, I know Ricky's almost done with all the the tech side. I do want to mention uh, if you are watching us tonight, we we're supposed to have Eric Rostin on with us. Uh, he was a science contributor for Bloomberg, and uh, been messaging back and forth today. And some circumstances have come up that. Uh, that he's not going to be able to join us tonight, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll refer. He said that we could refer to his article during the show, and if anyone had uh, any questions, they could direct that towards him via Twitter, and he'd be uh, more than happy to respond to those. So I'm sure as we go uh, throughout this episode, we can refer to uh, uh, the Forget Tornadoes, a rain bomb is coming to your town. It kind of <laughs> caused the stir among social media uh, late last week and over the weekend, so I know that we'll talk about that, and I hate that Eric's not going to be able to join us to uh, talk about his uh, research that he's done, but I'm sure we'll talk about that tonight. And speaking of microbursts and rain bombs and whatever else you want to talk about, uh, I'm going to toss it up to Ricky Matthews. Uh, Ricky's going to kind of lead the show tonight because his area, he and Chris, uh, up in the Tri-Cities area, just experienced a, a pretty massive uh, storm system that came through in the, uh, the beginning part of uh, July and uh, caused a lot of wind damage up there. And that's kind of what spurred the idea of uh, doing this show tonight. So, Ricky, uh, if you're good, I'm going to toss it to you, and uh, we can kind of start with the, uh, the content part tonight. All right. Thank you, Scotty. Yeah, we're doing a little bit of behind the scenes, and I'm actually checking out some of our time-lapse footage that we shot from our Holston Mountain camera today. Caught one of those little bursts of rain falling out of some of the showers around here. So, uh We'll have that show you here in just a little bit. But we do want to reference, as Scotty mentioned, some of the very strong storms that moved through our area, and even Brad's area as well, back in early July. We had this area of convective weather move through. We were in a pretty well forecasted event with an enhanced risk of severe weather across our area, a severe thunderstorm watch issued by the Storm Prediction Center. But we still had many people kind of confused about what came through, what was it, what's a microburst or a macro burst, and why did it cause such extreme damage? And so I think we've got a nice collection of people to talk about that tonight and kind of sum up everything that happened. Uh, first off, a little bit of background information. We'll pull up J the picture that James is sharing here. And we'll kind of show you what these microbursts did across the area. So when we're talking about the damage tonight, you kind of have a picture of what c came out of these storms. Notice all the trees here in this area that have been uh, snapped or turned over or damaged by some of the strong gusty winds that came out of these storms. And you notice it's not really just in that one area, but there's our other pockets scattered around the lake. This is Watauga Lake up in uh, Carter County, Tennessee, that were impacted by these storms. And Chris, we'll bring you in because as you work alongside me, you were working this night when the storms came through. Tell us a little bit about kind of what in general moved through um, in terms of like you know, just a line of storms or, or more of the supercell type. So tell us a little bit about what these storms were in general. Sure. Um, so this was kind of your, I guess, typical setup for this kind of stuff where you had a ridge of high pressure. And I don't know, guys, if you can share my screen. Is that all, at all possible? Yeah, if you initiate it on your side with a little green arrow in the top left, I will then push it out to everybody. Okay. Okay, there you go. I, I initiated for you. There you go. Good good? go. Okay, cool. So you got this area of high pressure down in the Gulf states, but uh, promoting this northwest flow because the flow around high pressure is clockwise, and you would get these little ripples in the upper level flow, these short waves that would kick off an MCS, a mesoscale convective system, or just in plain English, a complex storm. So that's what we saw forming in eastern Kentucky. But as we go to the radar, let me see, back things up a little bit. So you can kind of see where this all popped. It was popping west of I-75. You had a few supercells in eastern Kentucky, but we really didn't have an environment that was favorable for turning of the winds. We had a heck of a lot of wind shear but it was all unidirectional. Um, and you see as it gets across the Kentucky-Virginia line, you got these multi-cell multi structures. You got the uh, back building behind them, just again because of the, the strong shear that we had going on. But then watch what happens as it crosses the state line. You see this little Boeing segment right here that wound up meeting a lot of destruction in Carter and Johnson counties are where my mouse is, right there. It's the mountainous terrain and it just blew up. Okay, we had velocity. The velocity product was 
measuring close to 80 mile an hour winds. Now, of course, at that distance from the radar, it's going to be a little higher up off the ground, but those winds mixing down to the surface um, in what's called this microburst, or where and I actually came off the, the screen share here. So let me see if I can fix that. Yeah, and while we turn off your screen share, Chris, I don't know, are you using an external microphone? Would it be possible to move that closer to your mouth at all? Sure, yeah. I'm just using the one on my computer, so I'm sorry about that. Okay. Let me see here. All right. Um, what was I going to say? So are we good here on the image? Um, yeah. Uh, I, mean, Chris I, I haven't done this in so long. Sorry about it. Um, but yeah, so we had what was called this microburst, um, and it's where you got a lot of this, a lot of hydrometers or hail and rain suspended at the top of the storm. The updraft is strong enough to keep it all up there, but then you've got a little bit of what's called evaporative cooling below that. So the updraft weakens, and you get this rain bomb or the stronger winds that were uh, shown on the velocity product that were coming down to the surface. And so you'd have to imagine probably 80, 85 mile an hour wind gusts, especially where Ricky was showing the damage at Watauga Lake and parts of Johnson County, Tennessee. So probably the most widespread damage that we've had in our viewing area since the tornadoes of 2014, all from this microburst. And Chris, one of the things you know around here is you and I kind of went through and looked at some of the damage in the days after. It wasn't just one little area. There were almost multiple zones along that entire line where the swing right. was incredibly strong. Some areas where they seemed to be a little bit higher, maybe some uh, really isolated microbursts, and then some zones where almost every tree within a couple hundred feet was leveled. Right, yeah. And I think the interesting part, and I couldn't find... Um, sounding archives, but one of the interesting parts is that you go back and look at the model soundings for our area and you see at the bottom of the sounding this inverted V, which would show the potential for that evaporative cooling and uh, all the hydro, hydro meteors and everything coming down from the top of the top of the thunderstorm cloud and those stronger wind gusts mixing down as well. So you did see these isolated pockets, but clearly the environment as a whole was conducive for something like this to happen, which is why you saw maybe a little bit more large-scale damage in, in other parts of our area. And once those storms kind of progressed further to the east, they moved into North Carolina, so we'll bring Brad Panovich in here, talk a little bit about the line. As it continued to progress to the east, it hit some of the higher elevations of uh, North Carolina first, lots of damage up in the Boone area, but really even continued down towards Interstate 77. Yeah, yeah, once it got again. once it got out of the mountains, uh, we started to see some damage even across the Piedmont. Uh, Watauga area got hit hard by the same storm that went across Watauga Lake, so that's almost the identical storm as it crossed over uh, Boone. And obviously, a lot of folks up there thought it was a tornado um, because most people, especially in the mountains, really aren't used to seeing convective winds like that. Um, they are used to the strong fronts we get in the winter time, which end up causing a lot of damage in the mountains. But this was kind of a, a shock to them. But then it moved to Lee of the Mountains, and it kind of broke up into three separate bowing segments, um, as Chris was talking about. And it moved across the Piedmont of, the, of North Carolina and ended up producing uh, one of the biggest power outages we've had in the Charlotte area, and probably, I'd say, since 2011 when we had a derecho come through here. Um, something on like 700,000 people on the Duke system were without power across North Carolina. And some of them in the Charlotte area, there's a couple neighborhoods it took a week for them to get power back. Um, and the reason why was the infrastructure was so heavily damaged. So many trees had come down and knocked down poles and lines. And, you know, um, a lot of folks get mad at Duke, but if you look at the, the number of trees that just had to be removed first to get a truck in there to even work on the line, you kind of understand why it took so long for a lot of these neighborhoods to, to kind of get back to, to normal. So um, it was interesting across the Piedmont, most people understood that this was a microburst or downburst, um, maybe because we see more of them. But in the mountains, our mountain communities, there was almost to the point of hostility that we didn't call it a tornado. <laughs> um, and uh, unfortunately, one of the sheriff's departments up there posted an erroneous picture and shared it on their social media account um, of a tornado that actually occurred in the mountains of Colorado 
not in <laughs> North Carolina, and so people just generally assumed it was a tornado. So um, it was a big event, but I think it was a great teaching moment for a lot of people to kind of understand that, at least in our area, 90% of the wind damage we see here is from downburst or microburst type winds. Um, much, go ahead. How much do, and Chris will bring you in here too, how much do you guys think that those pictures, and we got a picture here from uh, the Butler area of what looked like a tornado, uh, but ended up just being some sky clouds, kind of had a play into people's perception. Maybe the idea of, I see with my own two eyes, you, you, you know, you can't tell me otherwise almost. Oh, it certainly didn't help um, <laughs> because I, I don't think anybody actually saw the scud clouds. They saw the pictures of them, and then they just put two and two together. Um, and maybe a handful of people saw the scud clouds or saw this. But when it spreads on social media, it's like, oh, okay, I saw the damage. I saw this gust of wind come in. It sounded horrible. Uh, I see a picture on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. Oh, it was a tornado. So it just made it more difficult to explain. And people, you know, people will get on you like, oh, what's the big deal? You know, the the big deal is it's it's not that people don't take tornadoes seriously. Obviously, they do. The problem is storms like this are exactly why it's a problem. You need to take all severe thunderstorms serious. And even in this case, there's certain types of severe thunderstorms like we had this day that are particularly dangerous compared to your run-of-the-mill pulse storms that we get in the summertime. Chris, you have something to add? Yeah, you know, uh, Brett was mentioning the hostility, and we certainly received that on, on our end, too. One of the things that, Ricky, you were mentioning was the picture of the scud cloud in Butler, Tennessee. The thing that didn't help that is I actually, I know the woman who took the picture, they got hit by the tornadoes on April 27th of 2011. So they see that, and like Brett has said in the past, you automatically think about the last big event that happened, and you try and compare. So, no, you may not see this rotating funnel, but you see something that looks like a funnel and say, oh, crap, it's a tornado. Mm -hmm. And, no, it, it wasn't. We all know that it wasn't. But trying to explain that to certain people when they saw it with their two eyes, it was, it was very difficult. And there was that hostility that you can use all this radar technology that you want, but you didn't see what was in my backyard. How about you tell my grandma whose tree is on her house and all this other stuff? But the thing that we actually went on air and tried to communicate is, number one, what it was. But number two, and, and I use this analogy, that if you've got a truck coming at you 80 miles an hour and it's spinning and it hits you, is it any different than if that truck were to come straight at you and hit you 80 miles per hour? No. You know, a building or a tree doesn't care if it's spinning or coming at you straight on. 80 mile an hour wind still going to do some damage. So by the, at the end of the day, we were just trying to communicate with people that the most important part is that two people died in our area, and they don't get to go home to their families because of this microburst, the tornado, whatever you wanted to think about. It, it didn't matter at that point in time. We want to educate people, but it wasn't worth the Facebook argument when two people in our area died. And with those two people, they were found in a campsite, you know, in a remote area of Watauga Lake, kind of away from a lot of those warning sources. Um, I mean, obviously, unless you kind of knew ahead of time that something was moving in, you may not have had notification, because I can tell you up at Watauga Lake, there's not excellent cell phone coverage. So it goes back and poses the question of, is there a level of severe thunderstorm warnings that maybe need to be transmitted via the WEA alerts that apparently aren't so dominant on those cell phone signals and will still go out even if the cell phone towers are down? It, 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 that's a good question. I think, and, and I think that raises a good point about severe thunderstorm warnings. Um, and even I kind of alluded to it. It's like we get so many severe thunderstorm warnings. It's almost become like a car alarm uh, <laughs> in, in meteorology that people tend to take them for granted. But... Um, if you focus on the impacts like Chris was talking about, I think the key part of this was, at least, and, and unfortunately for the people in Tennessee and for, for Chris and Ricky, but the fact that I saw what was going on over there actually probably helped the people in North Carolina take it a little more serious because when you see the damage and what's happening upstream with these storms, I immediately knew, okay, these are not ordinary thunderstorms. When you start seeing 85, 90 mile an hour wind gusts showing up, 
and the damage being caused, you can then relay the impacts a little bit better to the public. And there, there's one great thing about social media and people having camera phones is, you know, the, the fact that you can take pictures and video and get them to us. It, it, I know it doesn't help the people that, that got the damage immediately. It helps the people downstream because they, they look at a radar and it just looks like a bunch of paint on the screen to them. But if you can show them, look what this thing did, now they're going to take that store more serious and they're going to they're going to head you know head to shelter. So I think for a lot of reasons, what happened in the mountains actually helped the people in the Piedmont take the storms more seriously. We didn't have any injuries or fatalities considering the number of trees we had down. We were all about power issues and inconvenience, but unfortunately, you guys didn't get as much warning um, about of, of the severity of these thunderstorms as we did further east. Talk a little bit, uh, either Chris or Brad, about how these storms kind of look. Maybe, Chris, you're best for this since you've seen the video. When it was coming over Watauga Lake and, and over Fish Springs Marina, we saw an area of almost a wall of water, what it looked like, coming across the lake. Why did the storms look like that, uh, and why is that where the strong, gusty winds were? I'm trying to think. So I'm just trying to understand your question a little bit more. So why why did the wall of water just look the way it did? Yeah, uh, so why did the storms perhaps look like that? Why were was the cloud level so low to the ground in this case? I'm drawing a picture. Hold on. Oh, gosh. Chris is drawing. I've seen these drawings before. And... and while Chris draws a picture, uh, on your note, Brad, about severe thunderstorm warnings, we've had 155 so far this year just in our Morristown CWA. Last year, for example, they issued only 170. So we're on record pace to exceed that by the end of the year at the rate we're going. So we get a, a I'm lot of verified, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm done drawing. So here's our... Can you see that? I got it, yeah. Okay. So like we were talking about initially is the uh, the hydrometeor, so the water and the hail all being collected at the top of the cloud, and then once you have that evaporative cooling, it all rushes down. Now once it rushes down, you've got that downward force, you've got gravity kind of helping it out, and just making the shield of rain coming towards you with not forward momentum, again, because the winds are mixing down. That's the best ex explanation that I can come up with. Uh, maybe one of you guys could, could do something other than, like, terrible art here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looked like an octopus, Chris. I don't know what to... <laughs> no, I, you know, it's, it's funny. We, we, caught, we caught a pretty good... Um, it wasn't a, a severe downburst, but we had a little microburst on the east side of Charlotte yesterday caught from our uptown camera, and... Um, you know, it was a great time lapse that we caught of this rain shaft, and and I and I actually mentioned on the air the thing I look for is those rain feet. You know, when you start to see the rain shaft kind of bow out a little bit, like you showed in your illustration, um, it, that's the that's the air hitting the ground and spreading out. Um, you know, a good a good analogy is if you take a a pitcher of water and dump it on the table, you know, it's going to splash out. There's going to be a leading edge or a wave of water on that and when the when the air hits the ground it spreads out and you get almost like a little tsunami of, of air and water but what's interesting about that video that Rick is uh, Ricky's alluding to is you saw that initial burst of wind but man there were surges within that as you're getting like like surges of water and air coming down out of the cloud and if you've ever been to Niagara Falls and been on the Maid of the Mist when you get down near the waterfall you can feel the amount of air being displaced just by that water falling over the, the, the side of the falls. And a lot of times, not only do you have evaporative cooling like Chris alluded to, but the, the physical nature of that many water droplets or hydrometeors coming down displaces air. It moves the air out of the way. And so when it's crashing to the ground that quickly, it pushes the air. So it, it just accelerates. And in a day like we had on the 9th, the ground temperatures were super hot and the air was super buoyant near the ground. And this is heavy, dense air. It's the reverse of holding a beach ball under the water in the pool and letting it shoot out, it was going the other way. It was hitting the ground. So it's just amazing to see that in action. And, you know, you've seen microbursts like that that have produced winds of over 130, 140 miles an hour. So to see that that video was just amazing to me. And I think a lot of people got blown away like that. That's what a severe thunderstorm can do. But if you've been in it, I tell you what, you never forget something like that. <laughs> right. Brad, our guest, uh, our guest, Erica, he was going to come on and talk about 
um, the microburst out in Phoenix, Arizona on July the 18th. So I'm going to share a screen. I kind of put a little blog together just to give a visual. And let me see if I can find it here. Is everybody, can everybody see it okay? Yeah, we got you, Shay. Going on? No, I'm not sure what we're looking at yet. Is that uh, is it on yet? No? We're good. I think you just need to hit OK or play. One, two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in, in the blog here, you can kind of see some of the, uh, the microburst storm motion with cold air. Are you seeing these graphics okay? No. No. All right. Let me, uh, let me stop and try one more time. And now might be a good point while while Shay is getting that set up. Bottom of the hour, let folks know if they are tuning in to, to watch this microburst discussion. And they're looking specifically for Eric uh, from uh, uh, Bloomberg, who was going to talk about his Rain Bombs article. Last minute tonight, he did have an issue at home, so that's why he's not on. But we are continuing our conversation with our guest tonight, and that's a perfect cue because I see that Shay's got his screen up. So send it back yes. over to you, Shay. All right. So, uh, yeah, you have your storm motion, your cold air dropping, uh, downflow impact to the ground. This is just sort of some basic graphics of, of what a microburst might look like. Now this is the impressive photo that we saw from that week out in Phoenix, Arizona and it, it, it really is just impressive to see something of that magnitude. This was shot with a drone and there's a little bit of a uh, confusion on who actually took the picture but I think it was Bruce Hafner originally using a drone uh, and this is a close-up version of it now this is, again, where we got into that kind of the racy topic of being called a rain bomb because it does sort of look like a, an atomic bomb explosion, but it's, it's a whole different concept, really. Uh, so, Brad, tell us a little bit about this and, and what kind of um, microburst are you seeing here? Is this, is this different than what you would see in the southeast? Would this be considered a macroburst versus microburst? That looks like it's a little bit bigger. Um, so I, it's hard to tell from the square mileage wise, but based on the damage, I would say it's probably macro burst at looking at, at the width of it. What's interesting about out in Phoenix is that during the monsoon and anywhere in the desert southwest, they get the perfect setup for these downbursts because all of their moisture is really shallow. It's down near the ground, and they've got this dry air aloft, which is like the perfect setup um, to get your evaporative cooling as that moisture gets thrown up into the dry air, comes back down, and and you get this perfect setup. And the cool thing about out there is uh, it, th this is the where the macroburst or microburst was, but then you get a haboob off of this thing that will travel for miles and miles and miles, and someone will be like three counties away and get a dust storm and go, where the heck did that thing come from? And it's from some thunderstorm downdraft that was like two counties away. Um, and there's no rain, there's no lightning, thunder, it's just a big haboob hits them. So once these things get going, they go across the desert, and... Because it's colder, denser air, it keeps pushing, and it's like a cold front just rushing across the valley floor. So um, here, ours are more wet microbursts. You know, we get the more the atmosphere is completely saturated, um, the high precipital waters, and we have what's called downdraft cape. Um, you, you, in the summertime here, you learn to look at downdraft cape a lot because a day with a lot of D cape is typically a day that these downbursts are going to be more susceptible in our area. So I look for those two things, high precipital waters, um, very, very high decay values, and those are the days I start worrying about getting some downburst type winds. And, you know, th this whole rain bomb thing is, is kind of, it's like a sexy term, but there's already a term for it, so I'm not a fan of it because it's, we've already got microburst and downburst and macroburst. It's, it doesn't need a new name or new marketing campaign. It's already got something um, to call it. So I it, it maybe it gets some people more interested in the subject, which is always a, a positive. But um, I don't want people to think that these things are new. They're happening more frequently because they've been around ever since I've been studying meteorology. And if you look at the severe weather statistics, most severe weather reports haven't really been increasing, even though our observation has. Right. And that yeah. actually leads me right to my next question, Brad: Is do you think awareness, social media? Yeah, television, the availability of those images and the public's awareness ties into this theory or perception that they are increasing more, whether they are or aren't? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, people have a horrible recency bias with everything. Like like I said earlier before we were uh, live, I said, you know, this summer's hot, but it wasn't as hot as last summer. But everybody thinks this summer's hotter. Well, there are some meteorological reasons this summer's felt hotter. It's been humidity, but people always think what's happening now is the worst ever. <laughs> they always forget what has happened in the past. 
um, because they're just this is what's happening right now. So I think when people see a ton of pictures on social media or on the, the nightly news, they just think, man, there's more of it happening. Well, no, you're just you're getting more pictures of stuff. Um, you know, tornadoes. There's not a tornado I think that could occur in the United States now that there isn't going to be a picture or video of it somehow. Um, you know, back in the even the 80s, a tornado could go through rural Kansas, and the only person that knew about it was the farmer whose land it went through. Nobody else even knew that tornado was there. Now we have Doppler radar, we've got storm chasers streaming this stuff live, we've got people with smartphones. Everything gets documented and it gets shared around the world within minutes. So a lot of things that have occurred for years and years and years now seem are brand new to people who have never seen them before because they don't live in that part of the country or they don't get to witness this stuff firsthand. So I think that really skews people's perception um, of what's going on. I saw a great article. It was a political article. It was interesting. Someone said to me, you know, said in the article that the world wasn't getting worse. It's just that we are able to see the things that are going bad in the world more. So we think the world's going to hell, and it's not. We just have more visuals to go along with this stuff. A lot of this stuff was kept under the rug, and we didn't know what was going on, and I think that happens a lot with weather, is that we're seeing stuff. Uh, everybody gets to see every type of weather, even if they don't live in that part of the country. That's right, Brad. Yeah, population's grown. Uh, developments are, are much larger now, so the uh, the stroke of these storms coming through and having effects, with, with especially tornadoes, is just greater paths of damage. So that's... Um, Another factor to to also put into it. And you know, it's it, it's amazing that we don't that the number of tornadoes have actually kind of leveled off and gone down, considering that we observe so many more than we used to. So it makes you wonder how many tornadoes were missed in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put some footage on the screen now that comes to us from our friends at uh, WRBL meteorologist Bob Jeswald, who's been on the show before. They actually had two microbursts uh, this summer so far, coming straight through their metropolitan downtown. Wow. And when you look at the images of the, the storm and the damage that followed, you can almost understand why people confuse these for the sexier, more popular tornado. Brad, is that a problem you run into when, when you are now casting these storms and, and, and then trying to convince people afterwards this wasn't a tornado, this is a different phenomenon? Is there a little bit of a, a, an education gap there? Yeah, I mean, um, you, you, the sound that a microburst makes, it sounds like a roaring sound. It sounds like a jet engine. I mean, it is loud. And we've, we've conditioned people through sound bites on TV. Everything sounds like a freight train, right? I've chased storms for two years in college. I never thought a tornado sounded like a freight train, but it's like clockwork. We go out and interview somebody, yep, sounded like a freight train. I'm like, no, I live near the train tracks. And the tornado does not sound like a freight train. So when people hear this roaring sound and they see damage, I think that's the thing. They see damage and they naturally think, well, the wind just couldn't do that. It had to be a tornado. And Chris made a good point, and I, I can't preach that enough. Your house, a tree, a building, a car, it doesn't care what produces an 80 mile an hour wind, it just cares that it got hit by an 80 mile an hour wind. <laughs> it still breaks. If the threshold for your house is 80 miles an hour, it doesn't matter if it's a swirling wind, a straight line wind, doesn't matter. It's 80 miles an hour. That's the threshold for breaking something. It's going to break. Wind is wind. It doesn't matter what causes that wind. So people um, just need to get over this tornado thing because if you just look at the tornado numbers, we get a lot in this country, but there are hundreds of thousands of severe thunderstorms per year compared to tornadoes. The chance of you getting damage from a severe thunderstorm is 90 times higher than it is from a tornado, just because of the raw numbers. One of the amazing things around here is we didn't have just tree damage. We had some structure damage and also some huge objects moved by the wind. There was a huge water tank at one of the high school, or one of the elementary schools around here. It was empty, but it was still pretty big and pretty heavy, I imagine, empty, and it was moved by the winds. Uh, Christy O'Connor and I, one of our reporters, went to some uh, gentleman's house in our area, and his windows were just blown out straight by the wind. It wasn't hit by anything, but just the sheer power of the wind alone kind of blew them out, similar to what you may see in uh, some hurricanes, really stronger ones. So it's incredible kind of what just these winds did. I mean, Ricky, that's a, that's a great comparison you just made. We were talking just moments ago about the hurricane that's out there now, 75 mile, 85 mile per hour winds, and I mean, that's exactly what these structures and what these trees experience in this footage and, and up in your neck of the woods. Chris, did you guys experience, after your incidents, uh, a lot of folks thinking it was a, it was a tornado and, and not a thunderstorm? Yeah, we, we had a lot of that. In fact, uh, one of the things that I regret about this experience is trying to, I guess, engage a little too much in that, because we had people that, and, and let's face it, 
what sounds cooler? I made it through a tornado or I made it through a microburst? It sounds cooler to say that I made it through a tornado. You go and tell it at a dinner party and everything. But we have these people that, I, I mean, we got, we got put on blast, kind of, um, on multiple platforms, my personal page, the station's page. Um, and like I was alluding to, I just, the one part I regret about this event is that I engaged too much in it. I was doing it with the right intention. I wanted to educate people so that they knew for the future. Um, but it came across as I was trying to prove people wrong. Um, so I wound up having to apologize to those people, but at the same time, showing them that tornado or not, it did the damage. And no matter what conference you go to nowadays, we're all preaching impact. You know, we know the science like the back of our hands and it's great and everything, but impact, 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 that's what people really care about. Uh, and one way to do that is just tell them that, yes, you know, you may believe that it's a tornado. I know that it's not, but it still did the same thing. So it was, it was a little tough on our end, especially with social media. We had people really kind of laying into us, but... Uh, I think for the most part, uh, you know, you got to understand that those people are the vocal minority. Um, but for the most part, we we had some people that were on our side and and uh, actually trying to learn, which which was pretty cool. And I was surprised that some people in our area actually kind of knew what it was. I mean, there were people who was like, "Oh yeah, that was a microburst. I've seen that before." And one of the interesting comparisons that I got a lot was that some people. Um, referred to it as the same damage they saw during Hurricane Hugo. A lot of trees down across the area from the strong winds that moved through. Chris? And you know, Ricky, it was, it's actually funny that you mentioned that because I was at uh, a barbecue joint right down the road from the Elizabethan Airport. And the Elizabethan Airport, the main hangar, uh, the roof was ripped off. So obviously it's still a talking point. I was talking with the owner of the barbecue joint and saying, hey man, how did you and you guys fare out with that storm and everything. He goes, well, I mean, I could tell right away it was a microburst and everything. He, he doesn't really know that much about weather because I've spoken with him before, but he just kind of knew that uh, from seeing other things and from seeing the direction that the trees were in, that it was downburst, straight line winds and, and everything like that. And it was actually kind of cool to, to talk to him and actually have a level-headed discussion because there were a lot of people in the days following that we would talk to them and say, no, oh, man, no, it was, it was a tornado. And that's when you just kind of have to nod your head and, and say, yeah, okay. <laughs> Chris, yeah, the, I, I mean, we've, we've talked about straight line winds was brought up and we've been talking about microbursts. Talk a little bit about straight line winds to our viewers that may be watching it or wondering, what, what are those? Sure. Um, I mean, the way I've just always thought about it is... I, get what Brad was talking about in the winter time when we've got these mountain wave events and they just come just straight off. I mean, uh, that's what we typically see with these severe thunderstorm wind damage events um, is you've got these bowing structures that we were showing and the wind just advancing along the system itself, whereas a tornado will, will rotate. And that leads me into uh, another topic. Uh, that Eric Proceus with MemphisWeather.net, he's with FedEx, he, he actually uh, chimed in on our event page and, and asked to include a discussion on the hazards of these phenomena to low-lying aircraft as well as straight-line wind hazards to those on the ground. In addition, Doppler technology that was developed 20 years ago has effect effectively put an end to commercial airline crashes due to microbursts. And I remember some back in the 80s myself of some of the planes being uh, thrown down on the runways or... or uh, having crashes on the runways um, and that was in the 80s and early 90s until we actually became uh, more technologically advanced to prevent this from happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Brad, the TWR in Charlotte, that was the main reason it's there. Yeah, that's that's the reason the FAA put those terminal Dopplers in and that's why they're so good at, at detecting velocity and uh, low level wind shear because it used to be like, like Shay was saying, a lot of times uh, a lot of planes crashed on approach and even takeoff because uh, there would be even minor downburst type winds where the plane didn't have enough room to recover from that downburst and you saw a lot of tragedies occur 
uh, with plane crashes. You're looking at Flight 191. I think that's a Dallas-Fort Worth event. There was one in Kenner, Louisiana at the New Orleans airport, uh, a very similar one. There were several others that occurred, and they, and they finally started putting in these the shear detection um, equipment at a lot of the airports, and the terminal Doppler radar, which is at a lot of the major airports, was the main reason that was put in was to detect wind shear. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why it's not so good at precipitation. I could get into my rant on why terminal Dopplers aren't great for that, but um, that's an attenuation issue. Uh, they do great with wind shear. They're not so great with precipitation. Um, but they really do do a good job of, of helping out pilots. And pilots are really familiar with this. I mean, that's the aviation industry recognized that microbursts and downbursts were a huge issue for aircraft a long time ago, um, and it's just now it seems like the public is starting to, to catch on to, the, to this theory. And Brad, it's my understanding that radars, terminal, the, the main radar network out there is vital because when it comes to these microbursts or even flash flooding incidents like we've seen, it's really now casting where, where this is becoming vital because it's kind of hard to predict ahead of time if you're going to have a, a collapsing thunderstorm or not. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the cool things about the terminal Doppler radars were before this, uh, the, the sales um, algorithms went into all the radars where we got two second or two minute up updates. The terminal Dopplers were updating at one one sweep per minute. We were getting data, so it was like you get this real, almost real time radar data. Um, and one of the cool things about watching these in real time on radar is if, if you're into a radar and you're a radar geek, don't always look at the lowest slice. You, you got to look up in the upper level, the upper slices of the radar. And if you look at like GR analysts, you can see these um, precipitation cores forming aloft. And you can actually watch them collapse to the surface, and it's amazing. And so sometimes you'll look at the single slice reflectivity, and you'll go, why did the weather service just warn for that? And then I'll look at slice 2.5 and or 3.5, and, and I'm like, oh, look at that precipitation core that's crashing to the ground, and in a couple minutes from now, we're going to have a downburst. So a lot of times you have to look at all the, the volume scans uh, of the radar to, to, to pick these up, and that's really important that you don't get tunnel vision on that one single lower slice of the radar. And from what one of my friends who works at the Weather Service told me, and I discussed this with you a couple weeks ago, you know, almost almost like once you see it on that 0 0.5 tilt, it's too late. The winds are already at the surface doing damage. Exactly. It's like it's like it's like looking for the uh, the lowering of, lowering of the CC values. Yeah, that's a, that's a tornado, but it's already on the ground. <laughs> All right. Well, so we're getting what about 10 minutes or so before the top of the hour, Scotty. Uh, you want me to? I'll hand it back over to you, and you, you can kind of wrap up our discussion here as we get close to nine. Yeah, I was going to say I had um, our emergency manager up here. He was uh, we were talking to him about some of the, the flooding that could take place, and I told him we were talking about microbursts tonight. And he's counted just here in, in McDowell County. We've had seven microbursts in the past year and a half. So um, you know that kind of goes back to the article that that kind of stirs some controversy. Is there? Uh, that article said they were kind of rare, but in all reality, uh, Brad and Chris, uh, here in the western North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, they're, they're pretty common occurrence every, every summertime. And, and kind of piggybacking off that, it makes me wonder how many, quote, microbursts we have that are just on a very small scale. I mean, some of these storms that produce these winds just in a small, you know, one, two street area could maybe still be considered a microburst, but maybe not on such of the grand scheme as we saw up in our area with the, the macro. Maybe a, a nanoburst? <laughs> yeah, a nanoburst. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make a whole new term for it. Yeah, that, that was probably my biggest beef with Eric's article was that it, it, it made this out to be something new and made it out to be something that's occurring more often. When you look at the actual data, there's no indication that the number of microbursts is increasing. I fully agree with his assessment that heavy rain events are increasing. There's little doubt to me that that's happening. But the reason the heavy rain events are occurring more and more is mainly because these precipitable water values are getting so high. And typically, um, you know, precipitable water values are one ingredient. But as we know, to get a good downburst signature or uh, at least on the sounding, you need some dry air in the sounding. Being saturated from the ground to 300 millibars is not really a good downburst <laughs> setup. You need some dry air in there. And, you know, if you're, if you're talking about just super saturating the column, yeah, that's going to produce a lot of flash flooding and heavy rain events. It doesn't necessarily always mean you're going to get downburst type setups. Yeah, and another, and I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I just kind of want to revisit it. Um, is the article kind of portrayed it as 
we can't really detect when these are going to happen, but Brad, I know you were talking about uh, we could go to the SPC meso page and, and look at our down decay values, and that's a perfect example. We could say, hey, you know, this part of the Piedmont could be susceptible of seeing those downbursts. Yeah, there's a big difference between deciding which storm is going to produce a downburst and saying that there could be downbursts today. You know, it's like it's like when we when you go storm chasing. The biggest difficulty of storm chasing, you know there's going to be a tornado, but it's hard to pick which storm is going to produce a tornado. But if you're under a storm or you're looking at the radar, you can detect that it's going to produce a tornado. I mean, if you're really good at it. Um, so to say these these that they're hard to predict, I would say it's hard to predict which storm it's it's going to happen more than maybe a couple minutes ahead of time. But you know the setup in the general area. Like this event we're talking about on the 9th, of, uh, or back in July, excuse me, it you know that that was pretty well forecast to be honest with you. Um, the fact that we had an enhanced outlook in the middle of summer, um, that should have tell, told you something that <laughs> we were going to get some active weather, and uh, the storms actually you know maybe it caught us all surprised that the winds were 85. Maybe we thought they would be 60, 65. But um, you know the fact that we we're going to get downburst that day wasn't really all that big of a shock. And um, back in April, Shay and James and Ricky, um, you know, we talked about severe thunderstorm warnings and and how people take them serious. And we had a guest on uh, from Kansas City, uh, Joe uh, Lenardi, and um, not Joe Lenardi. He's a basketball guy. His name was Joe. I can't remember his last name. I have to look it up. But uh, Joe was talking about out there. He was kind of. Uh, Putting up the idea of we could do like an enhanced severe thunderstorm warning where winds are 80 to 85 miles per hour. And maybe it would um, kind of gather the attention of, of the viewers a little bit more if, if this was more of an enhanced idea. So now that we've experienced this in our area, what are you guys' thought on that? Do you think that's a, a decent idea? Or, I mean, we all know basically severe thunderstorm warnings are come a dime a dozen. So you know, people kind of get uh, kind of get used to this. So what is your thinking on maybe and tweaking that a little bit? Maybe putting the word enhance in there. If we do see 70, 80 mile per hour winds or larger than than an inch in diameter hill. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Like in most cases, I'm I'm into this whole hazard simplification that you know we've got. So many products with so many different colors. I think there's like 137 different products that can possibly be put out. So, you know, is, is adding one a good thing? Because at the and, and it's hard because I I can see two sides of the story that this enhanced severe thunderstorm warning or you know like we've got these PBS tornado watches that means something other than just a regular old tornado watch. Is that going to confuse somebody when you're trying to communicate the impact to them. And again, going back to being very impact-based, is adding something else going to confuse them, or is it going to help give them some kind of direction that, oh, okay, now this time it's, it, it means business. Um, it's something that I'll certainly have to think a little bit more on, because I can see, again, both sides of that story. I certainly don't want it to become like flood advisories, flood warnings, flash flood warnings, river flood warnings, river flood advisories. I think I'm forgetting about five or six here in, in my dissemination of this. And that's the main thing. It all comes down to how people communicate it, whether it's the apps communicating it, whether it's me communicating it, whether it's Facebook.com communicating it to you on your homepage. It all comes down to how that information is disseminated. Uh, for example, we have two or three different flood advisors in effect for our area right now, including a watch. So. That comes by a fun dissemination tonight. But, you know, it, quite honestly, I wonder sometimes if people even understand what a tornado emergency is. Like, how much of an educational input have we put on a tornado emergency? I can tell you probably maybe one person in our newsroom knows what a tornado emergency is supposed to mean. I, you know, it's more hoopla and more text instead of uh, info, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm with you guys. I, I think I don't I'm not I'm not for more warnings um, or different types of warnings. I think it's all about communication. I become a disciple of communicating weather information by impacts, um, and just giving something another label doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Um, I think I, this is where I'll pick on the the industry that we work in, the media industry. Um, I don't think we should be cutting in for every severe thunderstorm warning because 
in a situation like this, if you cut in and say this is a particularly dangerous severe thunderstorm, people are going to take it more seriously. If you're cutting in for every garden variety thunderstorm warning, um, you're, you're, you're misusing your communication power. Um, so I think in some ways, uh, if we communicate the threat better, people will listen. Because if there's a bunch of thunderstorm warnings, but all of a sudden they see me cut in when I normally don't cut in like crazy for severe thunderstorm warnings, they're going to go, uh-oh, something more serious is going on. Whereas some of my competitors literally will cut in for a frost advisory. Um, then they, they then you cut in for, they're like, oh, it's another one of these stupid cut-ins. They're not paying attention to what's going on. So I, I, I think in, in the media, we have a little bit of that, the share that problem of communicating threats correctly because we blow everything up and we don't save anything for the really big events. Um, you always got to have that one tool left in the tool shed or the toolbox that you can pull out for something that's really bad. And if you're using it for every minimal event, then you're, you have nothing left when you get to a serious event. I apologize. His name was Joe Lari, not Joe Lenardi. So that was close. I was close. I had to go back and look. <laughs> had to go back and look through my notes. So, uh, anyways, we're coming in on the uh, nine o'clock hour. So, uh, great episode tonight, guys. Good information there. Hopefully, uh, we don't have to deal with any more of these events. But if we do, uh, hopefully, uh, everyone watching tonight has just a little bit better idea of uh, what a microburst is and just how serious to take them. So uh, we'll throw it around. Uh, Chris, I'll let you uh, promote your social media, how our followers can get in touch with you, and then uh, we'll let Brad do the same. Sure. Uh, yeah, my Facebook is just Chris Michaels WCYB. Um, I post way too many pictures of my kittens. Uh, my Twitter is WCYB underscore Michaels, and my Instagram is Michael WX, and just wanted to take a moment to say thank you guys, number one, for inviting me, and also for the discussion. I, I find that every time I'm part of this group that I get to learn a lot, and that's one thing that uh, is kind of lost in our field, is that there's some folks who think that they, they know everything, and you realize when you're in it that you don't know as much as you think. So I've learned a lot from Brad, from Scotty, from Shay, James, and Ricky, all of you guys. Thank you very much. And that's why we want you on more often. So hopefully after the wedding day, things will kind of calm down and, and we'll be able to get you back on. Please, that's, that's what I've been saying too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Brad, before I, I let you uh, promote social media, uh, the area is under a flash flood watch, so that kind of gives us an idea of what, what to expect. We have been talking about heavy rain tonight, but kind of yeah. talk to us about what, what maybe uh, the Charlotte area uh, can see over the next 24 hours or so. This is one of the rare instances where I think a flash flood watch makes more sense than a flood watch because a lot of people are going to get very little rain, <laughs> but somebody's going to get clobbered. We saw today in Statesville. I mean, uh, we started showing the video and stuff out of Statesville today, and people all over the metro were like, it's not raining in my house. It hasn't rained in three days, you know, and it's like you try to explain it. It's, it's not going to rain everywhere, but where it does rain, it's going to be particularly heavy. So this is going to be one of those someone's going to get five inches of rain in like, three, four miles away, they're going to get a half an inch. That's just the kind of setup that we have right now across the area. But I'm watching the radar over here, and uh, I, this is one of those nights that kind of scares me because you got a bunch of these little showers popping up. The atmosphere is totally uncapped. It's totally unstable. We've got some a little MCV that's swinging down late tomorrow into, into Friday. We've got precipital water over two inches. It literally takes nothing to get a storm or a shower going in this setup. So... And because the storm motion is so slow, I just fear that something's going to camp out. And, and maybe in the middle of the night or even in the morning, we could have a flash flood warning at a weird time of day that people aren't used to seeing the flood warnings being issued. And it kind of does look like it may possibly could be against uh, the eastern place, facing slopes uh, here in the foothills where, where I'm at. So yeah. I think area, Scotty and Brad, we're going to really have to watch over even just the next couple hours is the Mount Airy area. Check out that flood warning, flash yeah. warning up there. That thing is literally not moving an inch and just keeps training over Route 52. So, Pilot, oh, Mountain, Pilot Mountain almost even seems to be enhancing the rain a little bit right through there. So, Yeah, okay. if you look at the flow up in Virginia, you can kind of see that southeast component of the low-level flow. I think we have more of an easterly component, and as, as Scotty alluded to, if that swings a little bit more southeast, and then all games on for those eastern facing slopes of the mountain, especially Upper Burke and Caldwell, it could really, and McDowell in particular, <laughs> Probably could see some serious flooding tonight. And that's hey, you're, right about, uh, you're right about that easterly wind. Uh, we got northeast northeast winds about 15 to 19 knots along the outer banks right now, and then it turns east as it heads inland. So you got yeah. nice little wedge working down into the backside of this boundary. Oh, that's 
And with this amount of moisture, man. And the thing is, this is where people look at their phone apps and, oh, that doesn't look so bad on the radar. No, no. <laughs> this stuff's all low top stuff. The radar shoot overshooting most of this stuff tonight, you know. Yeah, we had that exact problem earlier today in Statesville, Brad. You know, you looked yeah. at the radar estimates. Yeah. It was like two, three inches. Oh, it was way undercutting. I was, I was surprised. I look at even I looked at the radar. I'm like, oh, this is. And then I started looking at the sun. I'm like, oh man, this is one of those warm top. You know, it's like it reminded me of a tropical system or what it reminded me of, where you have got no lightning. These little feeder bands coming in, they're just dumping two, three inches an hour. So, well, I could rant all night about that, but it's going to be a fun couple of days here. <laughs> the only good news, it's not 90 degrees, so there's always the side benefit. Um, you could follow me at WX Brad on everything: Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Find me there. Um, if you have any questions for me, um, just be ready tonight. Even though we're kind of in a dry period, you can still get flash flooding. Uh, don't let that dry summer that we've had kind of deter you because it doesn't take much as we saw today. And, um, unfortunately for the people in Statesville, they had flooded, but it's going to be a good example of what could happen in other spots tonight if you're not paying attention. A good reminder to make sure your weather radio has flash flood warnings enabled for alerts. This would be a night to turn it on, especially if you're in a low-lying area. Yeah, definitely. All right, guys. Well, we appreciate having two of our favorite guests on tonight. Brad, Chris, thanks so much for coming on. I'm sure as we get into the winter time, uh, or fall and winter time, we'll have you guys on uh, more often. And Brad, look forward to having dinner with you tomorrow night. Maybe uh, maybe we can uh, kidnap James and he can come along. And uh, we'll go we'll go test out the new storm tracker or something. You know? Scott, I didn't I didn't pay Scotty to oh, say that for the record. Ricky Ricky's coming too, so it'd be a it'd be a party. And yeah, I'll, have to, see if I can get, I'll have to see if I can get the, the keys tomorrow. That would be fun. <laughs> Will you drive around and pick us all up in the storm vehicle? Because that would yeah. be kind of cool. Yeah. i got to get the strobes working so we can flash people. <laughs> it's a bit of a drive up to my area. <laughs> and I'll be down here in Charleston shuffling my feet all alone. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, come on up, Shay. Well, you can go, too. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks so much. Next week we're talking about lightning and uh, lightning safety. And uh, we're also going to be talking about what weather balloon launches uh, in the next couple of weeks as well. So I know Shay's been working with some folks trying to get them online for uh, the Lightning Show, and uh, we'll see how that goes. And Shay, if we can't, we'll, uh, we'll get something together, right? Yeah, yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that seems like the, the hurricane experts around the country are all busy. They're they're doing they're out of town. Um, I'm reaching out to some local WFOs, so if anybody watching the show, if there's any Mets that know a lot about lightning and want to come on, uh, give us a shout. Uh, yes. well, guys, I totally just remembered. We forgot to mention where David Reese is. Oh, yeah. David is out. Uh, he's uh, surfing in the Caribbean, right? He's and on a cruise ship out there somewhere near that hurricane. Yeah. Good yeah. timing, David. He won the lottery. He's going to be our on-site report. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. David is out uh, surfing on. Uh, was it Hurricane Earl? Is that the name, right? Earl? Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks for watching tonight. Uh, make sure that you uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, give us some show uh, suggestions. Anything you'd like to see as uh, we come into the fall and wintertime uh, air, uh, months, so well, we'll be able to uh, do some of those shows. So, um, thanks for watching again tonight, and we'll see you next week. Everyone, stay safe out there, and make sure you have those weather radio on in case you want to see some more.